This is our lesson on magnetism. And so we're going to start off with the introduction, uh, first of all, which includes what, a, what two types of magnets are. And so uh, there's one type of magnet. You bring your you know, family home a nice picture of a tree, and they stick it to the refrigerator, and they're going to use what we call a permanent magnet. And then there's these electromagnets, which are going to be the types that um, are used in the doors of the school, used to pick up uh, cars in a, in a junkyard, but they're going to be a magnet that includes some sort of power source, and current running through that power source is going to create this magnetic field, which is going to make an object a magnet, and those are going to be electromagnets. Uh, electrical fields, just a reminder, electrical fields are created by not moving charged objects. So in our previous unit on electrostatics, if we had a sphere that happened to have a lot of um, you know, extra negative charges, it would have this field around it, and that would be an electric field. But this charge, the charge wouldn't be moving. Now, electrons are moving, but in general, we're just talking about we don't have a flow of electrons from one place to another. It's They're staying on that object. So that's an electrical field created by a not moving. We'll call that a static charge. And then now we're going to have a wire, and we're going to go ahead and hook that up to some sort of power source, and we're going to run the current, once again, conventional currents from plus to negative. And when we do that, there's going to be this this field is created around this wire that we'll be able to detect with a, a compass. Now, in general, we're going to talk about classical physics models. There's classical and there's quantum physics. Um, but in classical physics, we pretend like there's electron spin, whether it spins or what it does is, is um, up to who's talking about it. But, but we're going to go ahead and look at the classical spinning model because that's good enough to, to explain a few things in this unit. So we have this electron and electrons are going to have this spinning and when they spin a certain direction they're going to create a north and south pole and that is called a dipole you cannot call you cannot create a monopole a monopole is this fictitious thing that just doesn't happen you can't have a north if i got rid of this you can't have a north without a south it's the spinning that creates the north and the south so therefore a dipole um at the same and when, when you think of poles North Pole, South Pole. Um, so the dipole is going to be the two poles created at the same time. You can't have a North without a South. That's the dipole. And depending on if the electron is spinning one way, like clockwise or counterclockwise, um, if it's spinning this way, you're going to have a North facing, you know, if it's spinning one direction, you'd have a North over here, South over here. But when you go ahead and you have it spinning the other direction, uh, all of a sudden, you create the opposite effect. You have the north, you'd have the south up top and north, north down the bottom, as you see right here. So we notice how these two are spinning in opposite directions, and that's why their north and south are are switched. In most materials, electrons pair, and that's why most materials around you, um, you you can take a magnet to, and it's not going to pick it up. Nothing's going to really happen. And so when you have a lot of pairing new uh, electrons with the spins pairing like this. Um, you're just going to have them neutralized. Not really much much uh, is going to go on. They're not going to attract some sort of other object. Um, we'll talk about ferromagnetic object, but they're just, they're just going to be neutralized. Overall, the north and the south are going to kind of complement each other. In general, when we talk about magnets, attraction or repulsion, opposites are going to always attract. So here we're talking about, we're no longer talking about positive and negative charges. We're going to talk about the spinning, the, the little pieces, the little electrons inside these materials are spinning aligned in a certain way, which you'll see in a few few slides, uh, spinning a certain direction, creating the north and south. But when you have a north and it's close to the south, it's going to attract to the south. And so you see that in the first set of magnets right there. Um, and then if you have the same poles, like the south and south or north and north, they're always going to repel from each other. So you'd have to apply a force to try to get those together. They're not going to want to stick together. So there's this term ferro ferromagnetic material. Um, iron is symbol Fe. Um, so it, ferrous it has to do with um, iron, just related to iron. Um, but ferromagnetic materials are special types of materials where electrons spin the same way. And so not all materials are ferromagnetic. Not all materials can have electrons spinning the same way. And therefore, not all materials can be either a magnet or magnetized. Uh, we'll see that. Domains, we'll talk about what a domain names, a domain is. Um, a, so ferromagnetic materials are materials that can have these things called domains. And domains 
which you'll see in a little bit, these are areas of a material where all the electrons are spinning in the same direction. So this, for example, if they were all together spinning in the same direction, um, this could be considered a domain because they were spinning in the same direction as, of a certain area. And this material would be ferromagnetic because it can have domains. And some common ones are gonna be iron, cobalt, and nickel. Those are gonna be the common ones you'll see around. And then you have some ferromagnetic, or so you have some alloys that you'll often find like steel. Steel um, can be magnetized. It is attracted to magnets. Um, it has to be ferromagnetic to be attracted to magnets, um, but it's not. they're not always gonna be magnetized. Popular magnet alloys are going to be steel steel magnets, and then the very, very, very strong magnets that you see. These are neodymium magnets, and so they're just going to be an alloy of neodymium, iron, and boron. Um, but those are going to be fragile. Um, I have a couple in the classroom, always breaking, because uh, they're hard to take apart, but when they, when you, they slam it together because they're so strong really quickly, they'll often break. But they're the ones that are going to be the really, really strong magnets. So the difference between ferromagnetic material that's not magnetized versus uh, ferromagnetic material that is magnetized is going to be whether the poles are aligned. So take a look right here. These little sections are going to be domains, areas where all the um, electrons are, are spinning in, the same, in a similar direction, therefore having a north and south pole. And those little, ma those little magnets that I have on there are just representing the, the actual the actual um, direction that the, 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 the result of the electron spinning, where's the north, where's the south, south as a result. Um, but something unmagnetized, it's just going to have random. They're not all aligned in the same direction. Uh, you'll hear the term soft, and that's going to describe some ferromagnetic materials that aren't going to remain magnetized very easy. So there's some that will, will, will remain magnetized and, and uh, stay magnetized very easily. Um, but some, some will just kind of go back to the original position. They're going to go back to looking like this, all, all kind of unaligned domains. So iron, nickel, and nickel are soft um, soft materials. The domains will become, will, will be knocked out of place. And, and they will they'll be like a paperclip. If you take a magnet next to a paperclip, it's going to align its domains and you're going to pick it up. Um, hard, hard is going to be the other term, and that's going to describe... Uh, metals like steel and neodymium, where they're not going to become unmagnetized very easy. Everything can become ma unmagnetized, though. So what is an induced or temporary magnet? A temporary magnet is created when a soft ferromagnetic material is in the presence of an external magnetic field. So pretty much what this is, is this could be your normal standard paperclip. That's a very poor paperclip drawing. There are some like that. Um, but poor pa paperclip. And then if you go ahead and you take a mag magnet and you go ahead and put it next to that paperclip, well, the paperclip's domains will do what you're seeing in here. They'll all kind of start turning in a certain direction. And as soon as they do that, so they turn like this. And actually, let me go ahead and draw it differently. Let me draw south here, north there. As soon as they do that, this right here ends up becoming a magnet of its own. And so in this picture, you have a south here, north here, and all of a sudden these two, this permanent magnet and this soft temporary magnet are going to be attracted to each other. And so they, they would come together. But what's happening is as this gets closer and closer, what's happening is what you see exactly in this picture. The domains are aligning so that the north is attracted to the south, um, lining the domains, and, and now there's some sort of attraction together. But it's soft, so if you take away your first magnet, when you get rid of this thing right here, um, lost my pointer, there it is. Uh, when you get rid of this, the magnetic field of that paper clip that I had would go back to kind of being unaligned over time. If you dropped it, there's a couple of things you'll, you can do to unmagnetize something you'll see in a second. So a permanent magnet, what is that? It's a magnet that's different than a temporary magnet because of a hard ferromagnetic material placed in a strong magnetic field. So if you get a really hard magnet, uh, you get something like the neodymium um, or steel and you place it in a really, really strong magnetic field, you can keep that, that magnetized for longer. And often they'll heat it up, put it in the magnetic field, cool it back down, and then remove the magnetic field after it's cooled down and, and it will be more likely to have a lot more domains aligned and therefore be a, a much stronger, stronger magnet. 
when it's a stronger permanent magnet. So what can demagnetize a magnet? Well, if you drop a magnet, that's going to be one thing. Hitting it a lot can ma magnetize it. And I guess I should have said the first thing, heating a magnet up. So you can use, a, you can use heat to, to help set a magnet. Because molecules move around very, you know, quick, quicker in the heat. Um, but you can also, so if you use heat in the presence of a strong magnetic field and then cool it down, still in the presence of a strong ma magnetic field, you can actually help magnetize a magnet. But you can demagnetize it. You can unmagnetize it by not having a magnet, a strong magnetic field next to it, and just heating it up. Or if you drop or hit the magnet, if you think about this, these these alliance can be, you know, if you hit 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 enough, they're gonna they're not really gonna um, want to stay aligned because a lot of the um, the domains are special. But in general, they're gonna want to try to neutralize themselves to not stay magnetic. So what happens when you break a permanent magnet? When you break a permanent magnet, you still have the spinning of the of the electrons in the domains. Um, and so as a result of that, you still have two magnets. You're just going to be weaker because you have a, a less, uh, less of a composition of areas, you know, just, just, just less electrons. The more electrons you have spinning in the same direction, they're in the domains together, the stronger the magnet's going to be. And when you separate those, what's going to happen is since you have south over here, north over there, they're going to want to come back together. So they're going to want to attract each other. The spinning is still going to be the same, and that's what this little section is saying. Now a compass, a compass is nothing more than a, a permanent, uh, as a, sorry, as a, as a permanent magnet that's free to float. And so there often you have like just a little, um, let's find my pointer again. So often you're going to have this little area, like you see in the middle. Okay, I found my pointer. There it is. Okay, often you'll have like this little area. What will happen is you have a magnet right here with a north and a south pole, and it's going to be like sitting on something, and so it's going to be free to float. And if you walk around, well, the south's going to be always attracted to north. So if this was the north pole over here, you'd all of a sudden have that switching and turning its direction so that the south is over there because the south would attract the north. So it's just a, a, a free, freely floating magnet. And the Earth itself acts like uh, a magnet. And so that's why a magnetic uh, a compass would, would act. That little magnet in a compass would be attracted by a certain, a certain way in the, in the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the way it's attracted, if you have a compass, well, the north of a compass is always going to be attracted to the south. So the north is always attracted to south. And so the north of the compass is going to be attracted since the north of the compass is pointing upwards. We call this the magnetic meridian is actually a south magnetic field. So the north of the compass is attracted to the south. And so really, when you think of it, the north pole is really the south magnetic pole. And then there's this little, depending on where you're located, um, the north versus the south pole might be slightly different. This angle um, we'll see in a second. It's going to be called the magnetic declination. But you're going to have where the actual, based on the, the spinning of the Earth, where the North Pole is, and then you're also going to have the um, the magnetic. They're going to have the the the, the, the magnetic South Pole. And so that that little bit that they're off is going to be this magnetic declination that we see right here. So the magnetic declination. If I'm talking about this area, this angle. I'm not very good at drawing right now. This different, this angle right here would be considered the magnetic declination. Whatever that is would change depending on where you're located. Um, and that is just the area. If, if you went ahead and followed a compass, you're going to get yourself to this point. But the actual North Pole is right there. So this different angle right there, once again, is the magnetic declination. Okay, and there's just more you can find out on the, on my SIGMAP physics website. You'll see links to these where you can find out more about the magnetic declination. The actual north magnetic pole has been changing. It's flipped multiple times in the past. But a lot more that you can uh, you can find out. And then you can find out about Santa Claus. You can go to the North Pole if you want go to, by clicking on that link uh, on my webpage. This is part two on magnetism, magnetic field lines. Uh, I'll probably include this in our, my previous lesson if you're, if you're in my class. 
Uh, we're going to look at magnetic field lines. And we had iron filings, which are just a little pieces of iron, and we dropped it around. And iron filings, first of all, are ferromagnetic, but they're just soft ferromagnetic. We dropped them around a bar magnet. They would start forming and sticking together in certain areas, and you would see these field lines. And when we draw these, we're going to draw them in, in a way that where there's going to be a lot more field lines close together, we're going to have a stronger magnetic field and therefore a, str um, a stronger area, more interactions uh, with other, other magnets or, or magnetic, ferromagnetic objects around it. And also the way we direct, draw these arrows are always going to be in the direction that a north of a compass would face. And that's why I have a little compass going around. Um, it's always going to be away from north and towards the south. And these ones, if I wanted to connect them all the way around, they would just come all through. These these lines over here are really extensions of these lines over here. You just have it all around this this magnet. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw this. This we'll just draw a couple lines. There's one. Uh, there's two. Oh, very bad. Um, there's two. There's. Let's go ahead and make it kind of neutral. Um, equal amounts on each other side. Okay, and then I just, I, I, I left out all the extra ones, but we're gonna have arrows going away from north. And those arrows are gonna be going towards south. So I'll go ahead and put arrows right here, and then towards south. And if any one of those arrows represented a compass, that would just be the, the north side of a compass. And the picture before the, the, the north was pink, so this would be, the pink side of the compass, or the the reddish side of the compass. Okay, so magnetic field uh, lines would look like this, and this is just saying the, the, the what I said earlier. They're always going to be greatest around the poles, so this is going to be an important point, and um, that's where that's where you're going to have the most attraction with other objects. They are going to be around the poles. It's going to be much more compact. Now, if you have a north and a south together, the actual magnetic field would look something like this. Uh, once again, let's go ahead and just draw that. Let's draw a couple of lines. So the north is going to want to be attracted to the south, and you can kind of see that in the kind of interaction there. So you have a little bit of this outside. And you can go ahead and put the arrows on the direction that a north of a compass would face, and it would be towards the south every single time. So there's an example of a north-south drawing. South north would just be the opposite. If this was south and this was north, you'd have arrows going the other direction, but it would look the same way. Here we have north next to north. And so you can see the re repulsion here, whereas here you can see the attraction because north wants to go to south. Well, neither of these want to be together. And the direction of the arrows are going to tell you if this was north or south, because if this was fifth face the opposite direction, that would have had to been the south and not a north. So let's go ahead and draw the north and north. So we'll go ahead and draw just draw a couple. Draw the 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 repulsion kind of interaction that's going on here. That north doesn't want to get next to the other north. So you don't really want to have them touching because that would be them getting close to each other. Um, just a couple of these. Not a very great drawing, but my pen's acting a little funky. And the north of a compass would want to go away from the north over here. So these arrows, um, you can have those arrows facing away and the arrows over here facing away as well. And then this thing called magnetic flux has to do with the measure of uh, magnetic field lines. The number of magnetic field lines in an area, here you have more flux because there's going to be a stronger area of interaction. Flux just has to do with uh, of interaction with other ferromagnetic materials. Always going to have more flux next to the poles versus away from the poles, as you see here. More flux here, less flux there. Once again, the density, two lines versus one, two, three, four. Four lines in the same area, so more flux and therefore more strength of interaction 